Today we are going to delve into distributive negotiation approaches and the framework. And when we talk about negotiations, there are two major approaches, the distributive and the integrated. Today, we are going to look at distributive. And in distributive negotiations, it is more of an approach that there is a fixed tie, meaning there is a finite set of resources and your goal is to acquire as much value as possible. Now, there are some downsides to this approach in that in trying to gain all of the resources available, there is a possibility that such an approach may strain the relationship. In future sessions, we will talk about the integrative techniques and we will learn that in real life, negotiations more often than not are a hybrid approach, which call for strategies from both the distributed and the integrative realm. However, for today, we are very left-sided, meaning focusing on the distributive approaches to negotiation. Now, for us to delve into distributive approaches, there are three questions that I mentioned in the live stream section, uh, session and things that you need to keep in mind. Because as I mentioned, one of the collateral issues in distributive negotiations is it may damage the long-term relationship. Before you engage in these strategies and approaches that we'll talk about, there are three questions that you should keep in mind. How important is the outcome? What are my long-term goals? How important is the relationship? And if the outcome or your long-term goals lend itself to a distributive approach or if the long-term relationship or the relationship in and of itself isn't that important, that may be an area where you engage in distributive negotiation uh, approaches. Now, this slide's very important. These three questions are, I think, form the framework for which you apply all your negotiation skills. So not only is it a highly attractive slide, you will see this slide again as we go back and talk about what approaches make more sense, given that in real life, the approach to negotiation calls for more of a hybrid approach. Some of the terminology that we need to be comfortable with when we're talking about distributive negotiations. So what is a classic example that you would use distributive negotiation techniques for? Automatically, what should come to mind is buying a car. If you go through those three questions, how important is the outcome? Well, especially with what's going on right now, the outcome is pretty darn important. I wanna pay as little for the car as possible, but I wanna get the best type of car that I can. In terms of how important is the relationship? Given that I don't plan on buying another car anytime soon, making sure that the car salesman really likes me and wants to send me a holiday card, not high up on my list. So the importance of the relationship, somewhat low. What are my long-term goals? This is not a career decision. This does not involve the raising of my children. This is a one-time transaction. My long-term goal is to pay as little for the car as possible, and it really goes no farther than that. So keeping in mind that the situation would seem to lend itself to a distributive negotiation, let's talk about some of these building blocks for distributive negotiation. And here, I just want to add a little more context before I delve into this. We negotiate all the time. And at the end of our four weeks together, I've done my job. If you are more aware of the things that are negotiable, there are over 97 people on this call with different moral compasses and different approaches to negotiation. My goal is to give you a set of tools that given who you are, given what's important to you, both in the immediate and the long-term, 
that allows you to negotiate in a way that is the most effective for you achieving the goal that you've set for yourself. So in keeping that in mind, when we talk about distributive negotiation, for all of these, when there is a fixed pie, there is something called the target price. What is a fair or optimal amount that you would like to spend for the car or for whatever you're purchasing? Now, when we say target price, that is bounded in reality. Clearly, I would love to get a Maserati, probably not because I'm not a very good driver, but a car for like a dollar, not bounded in reality. However, I've gone and I've looked at the average price for the type of car that I want. I know what my budget is. And if I drive a really good bargain, my target price would be X. So when you go into a negotiation, what is the target price or the amount that you'd like to spend? How far above that target price, in my case, let's say I see the car and I absolutely fall in love with it. What is the most that I would spend for that car? That is your resistance or your reservation price. And what that means is $1 below that amount would force me to go to a plan B. I've run the numbers. I know what my budget is. And if I can't get the car for X amount, that is the highest I can go, then my plan B is I continue riding my bicycle everywhere I go. Going into each negotiation, you should have a target price and a resistance price. The asking price will be, hmm, what is the initial price set by the seller? When I go into a car dealership, there is the manufacturer suggested retail price, and that has a tendency to start the negotiation. And the settlement point is where we end up. So in a Kind of conceptual way, these are the building blocks that go into every distributive negotiation. Where would you like to come out? What is the highest or lowest, depending on what you're negotiating over, that you would go? What is the initial offer? And where do you end up? So in putting it into practice, um, we are not a dog family. However, I was looking for an example that's a little more interesting to me than a car. And what I've been amazed about over the pandemic is the number of our friends and people in general who are either adopting or purchasing pets. So that led me to, okay, if we're in the market for a dog, what are some of the most expensive breeds out there? Lo and behold, the Pharaoh Hound is a pretty pricey dog. Now, Going back to the terminology that I just talked about, if I'm in the market for this dog, the target price, meaning slightly below what the average cost of the dog is, is $6,800. How high will I go? I really think this is an attractive dog. My kids are really into the dog. It would keep them busy. It would keep them off their phones okay, the dog has a lifespan of 20 years, I would go as high as $9,000. So going into a negotiation, I've identified my target price of where I'd like to come out. I've identified the highest I can go. If the seller says, Stacy, I will sell you the dog for $9,001, that has exceeded my reservation or my resistance price. The two terms are interchangeable. That will trigger my plan B. If I cannot get it for $9,000, I will go to the pound and get for free whatever dog they have left. So when your reservation or your resistance price is triggered, it requires you to engage in what's called the best alternative to the negotiated agreement or your BATNA. What is your plan B? As we get into advanced skills and strategies, the stronger your plan B is, the more confidence you bring to the table. And a quick example of that. 
uh, in March, it was college decision time. And you had a lot of seniors figuring out if they got into their top choices. What I saw, and my niece was going through this process, is once she got into a pretty decent school, so she knew she was not going to be living in her parents' basement for the next four years, her plan B was pretty strong. Her ideal school she hadn't heard back from. When she eventually heard back from her target school and she got in, because her plan B was so strong, she called their financial aid department and said, hey, other peer institutions are offering me this package. What will you do? So the takeaway from this, when you've identified your target price, what you'd like to come in at, your reservation price, the highest or lowest, depending on what it is that you will go, then you say, if my reservation price cannot be met, I will go to my plan B. Continue to refine your plan B. The stronger your plan B is, the more confidence you have at the table. If my niece had not gotten into any other school, the confidence or the ability to contact the financial aid department, she would not have been willing to enter into because she had no other option. So continue to refine your plan B and the stronger that is, again, the more confidence you can bring at the table. So you've now identified your target price and your reservation price. In real life, the other side is doing exactly the same thing. And in session three, when we break down how do you plan for a negotiation, we will spend a lot of time on this. Oftentimes, people's preparation for a negotiation focuses on, okay, I really wanted this dog and I don't want to spend more than X. If I can get it for less than $9,000, that's a win. And that is the mindset that they go into the negotiation with. Effective negotiators spend some time stepping into the shoes of the seller or the person they're negotiating with. What do I think their target price is. What do I think their reservation price is? Now you can do general research to get a vague idea, but one of the most effective things is once the negotiation begins, fight the urge to verbally vomit all over the other side. What do I mean by that? When people, and I get this with my kids all the time, when people enter into what has become increasingly negotiations with them, they feel that they must convince me that they're right. When you go into a negotiation, there's a ton of information you don't know. As I go into this negotiation about this hound, I know what I'd like to spend and the highest that I will go. What I don't know is about the other side. Spend time in the beginning part of the negotiation asking questions. How many dogs do they have? How many have they sold? When is the next litter? These things will give you insight into what their potential target or reservation price might be. Have we decided that we put a ban on all dogs coming from other countries? And you know that this dog comes from Egypt. Okay. You learn that piece of information. So now the only hounds available will be the ones currently within the United States. Oof. Okay. Now I am mentally recalculating. All right. I might be closer to nine than the $6,800 if all of us are fighting over. And then I'd ask, well, Betsy, how many hounds are currently in the United States? And Betsy said, oh, well, there are only 300 hounds in the entire United States. And with airline restrictions, whew, you can't take a pet on a plane right now. And in Maryland, yeah, there are two. That has dramatically increased the amount of information I've had, 
It's resolved some of the ambiguity, and it's helped me to adjust in that spectrum of 6,800 and 9,000 where I may be ending up. So when you enter into negotiations, resist the urge to inundate the other side with a flood of information. And trust me, I like talking about myself. So it's a challenge with a flood of information about yourself. Your goal and the research supports this. Effective negotiators spend time asking questions about the other side. You want to get information that will help you glean what is their potential plan B if you don't buy the hound? I now know that there are a ton of people who want them and there are only two or three in Maryland so they can readily find another buyer. You find out more information about them. So strategy or approach number one in distributive negotiation, after you've identified your target price and your reservation price, spend time trying to figure out what their target price and reservation price might be. Now, my approach to negotiation is very much informed by my prior occupation as a litigator. So asking lots of questions isn't hard for me. What's really interesting though is from the background of the people on the call, we have people from several walks of life who are good questioners. If I go to a doctor's office and with my health insurance, I've got like 15 minutes, within five minutes, they can ask detailed, directed questions to figure out the source of my ailment. So this ability to ask questions, to ask good questions, is a skill that we already have. What I'm asking you to do is direct that to negotiations. So you've identified your target price, your reservation price. You've asked, you've identified what you believe their target and reservation price has been. And then you've jotted down some questions that you want to know the answer to, to find out more about them. After doing that, and yes, it would be beautiful for you if they said, hey, Paul, my uh, target price is I'd love to sell it for $11,000, but I'm willing to go as low as $7,500. Well, guess what, Dorothy? You're not in Kansas, and life doesn't work that way. So they will never, especially if they're good negotiators, reveal to you what their target and their reservation price is. However, through the art of the question, which we will delve into next session, you have gleaned enough information to get a general idea of where they might be. Now, what's interesting here is if you look at the, tar at the seller's target price, the buyer's reservation price, the seller's reservation price, and the buyer's target, you see that both sides, anything between 9,000 and $7,500, both sides are open to making a deal. Now, when I say open to making a deal, the cool way to refer to it would be the ZOPA, Zone of Possible Agreement. Now, oftentimes, uh, my students will say, well, Professor Lee, I ended up being closer to 9,000 as the buyer than the 7,000. Does that mean I came up with a bad deal? No. Was it within the range that you're willing to purchase the dog? Yes. So I don't want you to think that if you don't maximize the absolute lowest price that you've gone with a bad deal. What is important to me is that you've thought through the negotiation enough such that you don't feel pressured or caught up in the heat of the moment and end up buying the dog for $11,000. Come on, people, it's a dog. Anyway, by asking skillful questions and using successful negotiation techniques, the goal for the buyer is to get the seller to enter into an agreement as close to the 7,500 as possible. Conversely, if you're the seller, your goal 
is to get the buyer as close to that $9,000 mark as you can. Now, in reality, the $9,000 will be unknown to the seller. And in reality, the $7,500 is unknown to the buyer. However, by asking questions, you can get information to figure out where on the spectrum the, ne the negotiation may end. All right, so that's me walking you through the scenario. How I would like for you to use the money count negotiation. There is a role A and a role B. And for the most part, a lot of you are on quarantine, so you should have time to do this. Sometime before next class, if you could find someone and do the negotiation, that would be great. Now, I'm not throwing you into the deep end. You don't have to negotiate now, but I will walk you through, and unlike with my students, I will now transition into some skills and approaches that I would encourage you to use when you do this negotiation. So yeah, it's unfair, because unless a person that you're negotiating with has taken the class before, you should be way better at them and clobber them in the negotiation. Anyway, the background is there are two accountants with similar work experiences and they work at the same company. And they've been going through a long reno. And as a result of a lottery, these two divisions have been invited to move in before anyone else. And the two options available are the second and the 10th floor. Going back to distributive negotiation. In this negotiation, we were talking about a fixed pot. There's the second floor and the 10th floor. Both floors have the exact same layout, nine conference rooms, 85 cubicles, coffee stations. However, the 10th floor is the money floor. That was kind of funny. That is where you want to be. You have a better view, less foot traffic, and you don't have to worry about the construction guys walking back and forth for the next year until the subsequent floors are done. The partner of the firm has asked you and your colleague to figure out who gets which floor. So this is the classic distributed scenario situation that I presented you with. Now, given this scenario, how would you guys, and feel free to use the chat, how would you prepare for this negotiation? You haven't sat down across the table with someone yet. And there's an excellent book called 3D Negotiation. And the book says that 80% of the negotiation occurs before you sit down. So in this case, we have, you go to the 10th floor or the second floor. So your plan B is if I do not get the 10th floor, ugh. I'm landing up on the second floor. Now, of course, I always think of myself first. How would your team feel about that? Is it that big a deal to them? So the comments that said, I would talk to my team. Yes, finding out what is important to them is going back to the three questions. Is your, would your long-term relationship with the other department or with the company in general, be adversely affected for whatever your long-term goals might be. Uh, do the teams need to stay together? If they're matrix, they can be split. Wow, yes. Again, you guys kind of like jumping ahead in the script. Yes. In distributive negotiations, people have a tendency to think of it only as a fixed pie. What we'll learn next week is that almost any negotiation that you're viewing as totally fixed, you can expand the value to both sides such that both sides can get what they want met. What are your interests? What are your objectives? What's your plan B? Are you willing to make concessions? And if so, what concessions? What do you know about the other side? Can we combine something such that, hey, I'll take the second floor or I'll give you the second floor and throw in 
parking. So that's an excellent strategy of expanding the negotiation beyond it just being about the 10th floor and the second floor. So you've done your preparation and I'm just gonna leave it at that because we have like 20 minutes. When you go into a negotiation over price, are you willing to make the first offer? Let me tell you what the research says. Um, I've already talked about your BATNA, which is the best alternative to the negotiated agreement. In other words, your plan B. And <clears throat> clear is that your plan B is not a number. It is triggered by a number. So going back to the dog, $9,000 is not my BATNA. My course of action of going down to the pound and picking up some mutt triggers. So if the 9,000 cannot be met, that triggers my plan B. So the more robust, again, your plan B, and that thing should exist outside of the negotiation. Me going to the pound to get the dog is outside of the conversations I'm having with the seller or the breeder. Okay. And again, the strategy here is the more robust you just found out that some one of those hounds showed up at the pound, the more attractive your plan B is, the better I am at driving home or asking for what I want. Now, if you remember, I told you that when planning for a negotiation, you should identify your target price of what you'd optimally like to spend and okay, I know I won't go above or below this amount. Taking it back to the dog. <sighs> All right, I don't wanna spend more than $9,000. What's interesting is going into a negotiation, people have a tendency to fixate on anything less than $9,000 and I've done well. That is the poor, that is a poor target for your negotiation. Go into a negotiation fixated on your target price. And the research says that when you do that, you have a tendency to increase your gains by 40%. And the easiest uh, analogy I can give you is for my students, they need a C to pass my class. However, if you've gone to Hopkins, you know that they're a bunch of super achievers. So a C is the reservation or the resistance price. Anything a C or better, they do not have to take my course again. However, all of the students or the majority of the students come in fixated on their target price. I want an A in this course. When they anchor or fixate on I want an A, their behavior, their performance, is much more geared towards getting that A, rather than, I just get a C, I don't have to see Professor Lee ever again, which I can't imagine anyone saying. So, in negotiations, go in fixated on your target price, not your resistance or your reservation price, because if, that, if I did that, wow, He'll sell me the dog for $8,500. Well, that's better than $9,000. Good, I'm done. No, that is far short of the $6,800 that I'd like to spend. So in distributive negotiations, it is very important that you go in with the mindset of you achieving your target price. Or you might say, okay, that sounds cool, but how do you do that? First offers, boom. So from our 45 minutes together, you know, all right, I need to go into a negotiation fixated on my target price. How do I do that? She's already said, ask a bunch of questions. And what do I do? The best way to make sure that you end up in the realm of your target price is to anchor the negotiation. 
and I recommend anchoring the negotiation by making the first offer. Now, let me clean this up. When do you make the first offer? If there's a ton of information that you do not know, but you're, and you've asked questions at the beginning of the negotiation to clear up some of that unknown, and you still don't feel that you have enough information to make a credible first offer, then don't. But if you've done your research, and you have, you know how much these hounds go for? You know, the average price, and this is true, the average price is like $8,000, which is just comical to me, but whatever. And you know that you will go up to 9,000. You don't want your first offer to be within your re reservation and your target price. Your goal is to negotiate into that zone. If I'm open to anything between $6,800 and $9,000, my initial offer, which I encourage you to make, will not be in between $6,000 and $9,000. I want to negotiate into that range. So my initial offer would be, hey, Simone, you got a couple of these dogs. I'll unload one for you. Uh, I don't know. You got like cool stuff on the wall behind you. I like your glasses. Um, yeah, how about 6,500? My goal is to negotiate into the range. Now, a couple things, and this is just strategy free of charge. People listen until they hear the answer that they're looking for. So as soon as I say the number, 6,500, Simone, just like in the Peanuts cartoon, wah, 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 anything that comes out of my mouth after that, she's not paying attention to. So if I want to explain my justification for this amount, I'm going to front load explanation first. You know, I saw your dogs. The mom's kind of ugly. She's got like a weird toe. I don't know if dogs have toes. A weird paw. Uh, they smell kind of funny. I don't know, whatever. I'm not a dog person. So, because I like you and the 45 minutes you've spent together, I'll give you, say the number, 6,500. Then, folks, after you've said your number, shut up. There is nothing that you could say after you state the amount that's going to bolster or improve. If anything, it conveys a lack of confidence and a further need to explain. Explain first, say the number, and then be comfortable with silence. Because Simone, she's not even smiling at me. I say 6,500 and she's just going to stare at me. And the research says, and this is a little more gender specific, females have a tendency to be very uncomfortable with that silence. And what can happen is, I mean, Simone, I mean, I said 6,500, but I mean, I could, I could go up and then with her saying nothing, I begin to negotiate against myself. You don't wanna do that, folks. So I'm gonna say the offer. Simone clearly still isn't gonna smile, but I'm going to sit there and my kids have shown me how. I've gotten out my phone. I've practiced my selfie mode. I've got this total look of serene confidence as I wait for her to react. I've now attempted to anchor the negotiation at $6,300. Of the range here, I would like the conversation to hover around here. When you Anchor the negotiation by making the first offer. A weird thing happens in people's brains. The research says that when I say 6,500, Simone's brain is going, how in the world did she come up with that number? And she begins to go through a mental exercise to either draw out all of the negative qualities of the dog that would justify that or try to make sense of it, which is a beautiful thing because her subconscious is doing the work for me. Now, Simone's taking a negotiations course and she's like, yeah, nice try. So I said 6,500 and she sits there. Hmm. 
what, and I usually give my class a little quiz at this point, when someone anchors the negotiation before you got a chance, what do you do? How many people think that if someone sets an aggressive anchor, that it is a good thing to ask them to explain how they came up with that number? Yes or no? Um, how many people think it makes sense just to get up and walk away? How many people think it makes sense to make an aggressive counteroffer yourself? All right, folks, here's the deal. In terms of making an aggressive counteroffer yourself, that very much depends on who you are as a negotiator. There are some people who like to negotiate the way I like to play tennis. I whack it across the net and I like it when it's whacked back to me. If that is the tone that you wanna set for the negotiation and that works for you, go ahead. Make, um, walk away. If your BATNA or your plan B is so phenomenal, then yes, drop the mic and in a dramatic fashion, get up and walk away. But if your plan B is not that good, I don't recommend that course of action. Another option is should you make a joke, which is my personal favorite because it plays to my personality. Now, ask them to explain, no, er, and why is that a wrong answer? It is a wrong answer because when you begin to ask questions, you're engaging or entering into that person's reality that on some level, that number is a credible one. So don't do that. In situations like this, if someone anchors the negotiation high, Simone's like, Mm, $17,000. I'm not going to ask her to explain it. However, a very human need is the need to feel heard and understood. I respect Simone regardless of her initial offer as a human being, so I'm not going to ignore her. I'm going to give her eye contact, huh? And I'm going to acknowledge that she said something and that I received it. I'm not going to repeat the number because again, that gives it weight. At this point, I would attempt to re-anchor the negotiation. So in response to her 17,000, and again, it needs to run through the filter of, wow, how important is this dog to me? How happy will it make my kids? I would have, if I'd done the first offer, I would have started out at 5,800, but wow, if she anchored at 17, and this is how good strong initial anchors are. All right, I'm gonna counter 7,000. I've already now countered with a number that is far above what I would have said if I'd made the first offer. So keep that in mind. Some people like to give ranges. I'm not a huge fan of ranges, but if you give a range, that range still should be considering how important the negotiation is to you, how strong your BATNA is, as close to being outside of your initial reservation price as possible. All right, concessions. What are you willing to give up in the negotiation and the beautiful thing about concessions and going into a negotiation, I think it is important to have, what am I willing to give up on? And concessions are kind of like dinner invitations. So uh, Roberto invites me over to dinner. If you're at least somewhat polite, him inviting me over to dinner creates what? A corresponding obligation on my part to have him over to dinner. The nice things about concessions, when I give something, it should evoke the need for the other side to give something back. And concessions and the strategy behind them is it helps to establish trust. In my negotiation with Simone, the first five minutes, I would make a concession, a small one, 
to establish trust and rapport, give her some information freely in the hopes that she would then share something with me. That begins to establish a level of trust. If I give something, it sounds like, yeah, thanks. Well, then I stop making concessions. Do not make unilateral concessions. But it does open up the negotiation to start in a very different footing. I tell my students this, and then we will sign off for today. I never have someone, I never have their attention so much as the first five minutes of class. It is within those five minutes that they figure out, is this class gonna suck or not? Do I really have to come to class? Am I gonna get anything out of it? After you have made those mental calculations, the remaining semester or eight weeks is just a fulfillment in that role. If during a negotiation, I can make a unilateral, I mean, I can make a concession and open up that I am a trustworthy, open person and the person responds, that gives us the ability to negotiate in a very different way than the vigorous game of tennis back and forth. And the best way that I can uh, talk about this is I'm not a hugger. I, you know, I hug my kids, I hug my family, but I'm just generally not a hugger. Whenever I, and I have a joint appointment over at the School of Public Health. Of course, with the pandemic, this will no longer be a problem. There are some people that are just huggers. There are some people that you walk over and before you know it, I'm like, holy cow, what just happened? My arms are around them and I'm hugging them back. How'd that happen? It happened because when they approach you with the honest openness of, hey, how you doing? It is human nature to respond in kind, even if it's not your natural inclination. As we begin to unpack negotiation strategies and approaches, I really will focus on the magic first five minutes in a negotiation. How can you, and do these work all the time? Of course not. Does negotiation work all the time? Absolutely not. If it did, I wouldn't have been a litigator for 10 years. However, making a small concession at the beginning of a negotiation very much signals to the other side, I'm trustworthy, and I'm open. And that openness could be I'm open to having a result that allows both of us to meet our goals. Hopefully I will see you next week. See ya.